Canada and Welsh appropriates 29,822, uh, excuse me, $29,822,775 in CARES Act funds to certain accounts for the benefit of various metro government departments. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We defer because no one's here. Right. Well, but we also we defer to you. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. So we'll. No, I think we defer. I'm trying to remember. Well, actually, I moved that we defer by rule. All right. Say. Well, well, okay. Thank you, John. Right. So I move. Yeah. We have a move by Mr. Hayes. Second. 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 RS-2020-660 by Toombs, Taylor & Welsh approves Amendment 5 to a contract between the Metro Board of Health and Vanderbilt University acting by and through the, social, the School of Medicine to participate as a member site in the CDC tuber, uh, Tuberculosis Trials Consortium Studies. Moved, so moved. Second. Okay, we have a second. It's been moved and properly second. Any discussion? All right, no discussion. Um, all in favor? Aye. Any against? All right, motion carries. All right, it's 2026-61. By Toombs, Taylor, Bradford, Hauser, and Suora accepts a grant from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development to Metro Social Services Commission to fund two staff positions for the Homeless Management Information System. I have a motion? Second. It's been probably moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? Uh, so, Ms. Tackett. This is a renewal grant. It's an annual grant to pay for staff for one year. Uh, it's a full-time staff to run the Thank you. Any, any additional discussion? Of, uh, of, of your staff in the Homeless um, Commission? Um, we do have uh, 11 staff members, uh, and we have a demographic. Are you looking at age, race? Uh, How many women? Women. Um, it's easier to say we have three men, so the rest is women. Okay. And we're very, 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 all. What about uh, people of color? Uh, maybe four. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. All in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Oh. Right. We have a late filed resolution by, by Councilman Toombs, a resolution accepting a Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, WIOA. Oh, I'm sorry, I did skip one. Thank you so much. I'm moving. I'm ready to get going, get, get to this meeting. All right, resolution 2020-665 by Hall, Virtue, Taylor, and Welsh. Request Mayor Cooper immediately cease the wind down process at the Bordeaux long-term care facility and work to secure an agreement with an emergency operator to keep the residents safely in place during the pandemic. So moved. Second. Right. It's been moved and probably seconded. Um, do we have any discussion? <clears throat> yep. As the members know, uh, National General Hospital is looking at the operational and financial records from Signature. We believe they finally gotten everything they need for their review. It's going to take them a couple of weeks because it is voluminous. Um, and we can understand that, that path that the council may choose. We'd, we would not understand this path of stopping the wind down and securing an emergency operator for, for several reasons. If you talk to Dr. Webb, the wind down to zero has no impact on his decision or his ability to secure the bed licenses and then go on to operate long-term care, should that be the will of the council. What is preeminent, I believe, for this body and certainly for the mayor 
is the care of the patients that are there and their well-being. The last we heard as of Monday, they're down to 14 patients. This is a four, 419 uh, bed license facility. Uh, they've been engaged in the wind down, not just since this summer. Uh, the council members who were here last term may remember the contract that they approved in 2016 imposed upon signature the obligation begin transferring patients then that you can begin transferring to outside facilities. And they've been doing that. So this has been an ongoing process. When they transfer patients, it is done through several medical checks and procedures. There is a transfer readiness protocol. Not a single patient, not a single patient is transferred until a physician says they are in good shape and ready to be transferred and until the physician signs the order. When the patient arrives at the new facility, it's a facility that they've chosen. They give signature their top three other facilities in the county where they want to go, and signature gets them into one of those top three. After the patient arrives, there's a checkup by signature, make sure the patient arrives safely. And the state oversees the process when you're in a wind down process to make sure the patient transfers are going well. Medically, it is in the best interest of those patients to continue the transfer process. That's important, and I want to say it again. Medically, it is in the best interest of the patients that the wind down continue. You all received a letter from Signature from their staff, and I'll read the excerpt that was submitted to you November 16th. Most importantly, we do not believe that it is in the best interest of the remaining patients of the Bordeaux facility to interrupt the process now. Practically stopping the wind down now would be extremely disruptive. We checked with our own medical staff. Dr. Stephanie Bailey wrote she adamantly agrees the transition process for the residents at Bordeaux should not be stopped. Part of the risk that's happening here is that the senior level leadership staff members at Signature they understand the wind down process is going on. They understand where this process has been leading for years and they're leaving. They're going on to other facilities, other signature facilities, other nursing home facilities. If you keep the patient population here while the senior staff is leaving, that is not a healthy recipe. Legally, the bottom line for us is we can't just tell signature, stop the wind down and stick around. They are leaving. Their contract ends. They do not want to extend it. We would love for them to stay. We asked them to stay. They made clear months ago they have no interest in staying. This particular model was not profitable for them. It has not been profitable in the industry. We got zero, zero responses to our RFQ. And I know the pandemic has not helped that industry as it exacerbated the problem, but we can't force Signature to stay. There's nothing legally that gives us that option to go uh, require. We can't find any operators. As you know, we did the RFQ. Years ago, we did an RFQ and sent it out to 167 operators, and 161 of them told us, you can't make this work. Today, that's zero. That is not unusual in the industry now because of the way the model has worked. And today in Tennessee, there is not a single city not a single city that subsidizes long-term health care. A standalone facility separate and apart from an adjacent hospital no longer works in the industry. I wish that were not the case, but that is the scenario we've been handed with. So again, for all of those reasons, but primarily and fundamentally and most importantly, for the sake of the patients and the medical personnel that you're hearing from, we ask you not to interrupt the wind down and to allow the patient transfers to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jameson. Any further discussion? Uh, Councilman Glover. So, uh, <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken on the bills, uh, I don't really know. I'm, I'm going to refer this to Mr. Cooper, if I may, as a term from yesterday. I believe those two were deferred, were they not for one meeting? Uh, both. Both of the Bordeaux ones that were considered yesterday uh, received a negative recommendation in committee. So okay, we didn't defer at all. Okay, right. I was, I was trying to remember because we were deferring some and not. Okay. 
So I'm just going to say what my concerns are. This population has been treated badly from the very beginning. I, I don't think I'm comfortable with anything we've done. We were told very clearly that, because I was on the council when we, when we did this, we were told very clearly that this was going to fix it. This was going to be the answer. This was it. And we, we trust and we believe. The, the concern that I've got, and I cannot get comfortable with this, is where is the golden parachute? If it doesn't work by the time Signature walks out the door, what assurances do we have to take care of these individuals? And I'm, I'm greatly concerned about it. I mean, if, if you've got the answer and it's right there, then I'm all ears. But I'm, I'm very, I, I mean, to tell you I'm not concerned would be a bold-faced bold lie. I am concerned. Mr. Chair, may I address that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we're as disappointed as you are that Signature couldn't make this work. And we, the mayor took office, and at the end of of the, he'd been in office maybe a month or two, knowing what the previous ordinances were the, that the council had passed, directed, figure out how we're gonna make this work. Uh, I believe Mary went to Signature, hey, do you, wanna, do you wanna continue this? And their initial response was, yeah, they wanna continue it. They are gonna participate in the RFQ. We can't just hand it to you, Signature. We have to go through a competitive process. And they very much wanted to participate in it. I'm no expert in this, but I think the pandemic changed everything. I think the pandemic changed the financial model for healthcare across the country. And clearly, as you've read, the pandemic has been particularly hard on nursing facilities. In terms of how the patients that are there have been treated, though, every single one has gotten into another nursing facility. Not one, not one is being kicked to the street in any sense whatsoever. There's a reference in one of the recitals that the patients don't have the financial means to obtain needed care through a private facility. That is patently false. 100%, 100% of the patients in this facility are covered. They are being transferred to other for-profit facilities. It'd be great for them to stay, but they have all been transferred with the exception of the 14 that are still being transferred left. I think that'll probably be at zero within two weeks, but all of them will be in a licensed medical care facility. And that's- are you, are you they're all private pay? No, these are Medicare, Medicaid okay, patients. Okay, they're dual eligible. Correct. Okay. Right. Okay. Because I was like, I was not under the impression that, that it was private pay. No. All right. And I know you and I discussed the number. I think you said there was roughly 25 dual eligible facilities in Davidson County. Correct. Um, so let's answer my basic question. Two weeks from now, all 14 are not moved, are not placed in, in a position and all of a sudden, uh, Signature pulls out. What are we doing to take care of those individuals that may still be left? Okay. What assurances do we have? Right, a couple of things. Number one, I, and I'm not discounting your hypothetical, but a Signature will tell you they're gonna be at zero by December 18th. They are that confident of the transfer process, how smoothly it's going. Signature is obligated. They are obligated to find care and to continue providing care for their patients. They can't just walk out the door when it gets down to whatever their contractual expiration date is and say, good luck. The state wouldn't let them walk two feet out the door. So it's on their, it's on their dime to continue the provision of care. And that's, that motivates them and that's much better for the patients that there's that motivation. So there's not any concern on our part that you're gonna have patients lingering at the facility that don't have medical care or, or physician care. How active is the state in it right now? Uh, I can't tell you that they've been calling every day. They usually are sort of a reactive body. Uh, so for example, when we were getting reports that a patient had died because of transfer, the state, that's when they jump in. Um, uh, not just the state, but the, the, any physician that had, would have overseen that would have made a report and Signature would have been obligated to make a report. But they are, they are there as a constant monitoring source. All right, thank you. Chair, thank you. Councilmember Benedict. Uh, then I'll come to you, Councilmember, and then to you, Councilmember. Uh, yeah, Council. I have a, a question oh. for Mr. Jamison uh, related to this. Uh, we, you talked about getting information to Nashville General, uh, Dr. Webb, and then uh, 
possibly transferring the licenses we have to the International General. But that seems almost counter to what you're saying as far as the sustainability of this. Is that something we even want to do if look, there are so much vacancies in other nursing homes in the area? Because I think you told me that none of them are at capacity, that all the nursing homes are under capacity. So are we anticipating in the future there will be more needs, so therefore we want to be proactive and set up a site at, uh, with National General? Or are we just, what, why are we doing that? Sure. So. It, this has a this is a lengthy, complicated answer. I'm going to give you my thumbnail sketch and proceed all of that by saying this is certainly no area of expertise for me. Um, Metro admittedly has not had, from a fiscal perspective, a positive experience with long-term care, and it was beginning in 2014 where council members, council member Glover and council lady Allen, who were there at the time, will recall long, hard-fought fraught discussions on the council floor with real aggravation that we were spending $10 million annually on a subsidy in addition to what had been funded otherwise. And that's what led to this continued anxiety about this just can't work as a, as a subsidized entity anymore. Once the private sector, beginning in the early 90s, the private sector figured out how to make Medicare and Medicaid work for them to make it a profitable venture. And so you had private facilities emerging and wanting to take care of patients. And of course, council members were hearing, we can do this for free and we can do a better job for free. We, we in the meantime, had a one-star facility that just couldn't seem to get out of the one-star facility ranking that we were subsidizing, uh, nine million plus another million for the Knowles, while we're looking at competing facilities doing a better job for free. That was the dynamic that led to council frustration and the council votes stating, essentially culminating with, we're getting out of this business, and, and I'm, I'm truncating it. There was a charter provision that says, here are the things you do as a government. If you want to get out of any one of them, you have to declare it obsolete, and that's what council does. They, they pass that ordinance, so that's, that's on the books now. General Hospital, I think, has now, I think, this is my guess, watching the private sector make Medicare and Medicaid profitable for long-term nursing care, they want to see if they can do the same thing. And, and more power to them if that's a conclusion they're coming to. So they're now looking at signatures, financial and operational records. And as long as they have the, the, the bed licenses, the 419 bed licenses, that's the key um, collateral that Metro has. They are in Metro's name. Uh, Dr. Webb is comfortable that we've taken the appropriate steps to secure those bed licenses, hold them on reserve, you place them on inactive status so that we're not paying this annual fee on it. But he will at some point come back to the council, and this will land in the council's lap, and he will say, I'm going to guess one of three things, purely speculating. One, he'll say, we've looked at it and just decided it's not for us. Possible. Number two, we've looked at it, we think we can do it without the subsidy that you've that has always bothered you. Or number three, we've looked at it, we can do it, but it's gonna cost X dollars. And then that'll come to you, and that'll be your choice again, and we'll go back through the history of, of what council's decided and see if it's a new day, and if you wanna take a new track at, at this venture, or leave it to the private sector. But at the end of the day, it does come back to you. That's why I think the current approach that Councilman Hall has taken doesn't help that approach at all. Um, and that's that's why I was making those comments. The, the, the being able to turn the information over to National General is not committing us anything. It's just we're exploring if this is a possibility. Okay, great. I just wanted to make sure we weren't committing ourselves if this is like a road we shouldn't be going down. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Is that all, Councilman? Thank you. Councilman Benedict, please. Thank you. Chair, um, Mr. Jamison, if you wouldn't mind sticking around, some of my questions are for you. So at, at this point, um, the horse has left the barn, right? So these patients have the majority of them, you said there's 14 left? Um, 14 as of Monday, it wouldn't surprise me if there's fewer. Okay. So at this point, it seems untenable to stop the wind down process, which in my opinion, so that's why I cannot support this, this resolution. However, I think it's a very important thing for us to talk about 
if we can't stop or if we choose not to stop this wind down because it's impractical, because it's not in the best interest of the 14 patients or fewer that are left there today that may be gone in the next two weeks and also the employees who are transitioning. What I what I would like to do, in, in, in Mr. Jamison, you and I spoke a little bit about this and I spoke with Director Cooper about it today or uh, just a short time ago, is what's happening to the care of the patients? You mentioned that there's state oversight. You mentioned that Signature has given a, I'm not, I don't remember your exact words, but basically, a, hey, they're doing good through the transition process for lack of a better term. My concerns are that when we have a patient in a long-term care facility move from one room to another room just down the hall, with this demographic, that can cause someone to, to have all kinds of medical issues that then can result and lead up to their death. We, as it's reported so far that there's been between three and seven patients who have already died. We don't know if that's, I don't want to assume, I don't want to state in any way, shape or form that that is due to the transition. And again, that is a reported number that I've just received this afternoon. So in, what I would like to see is what can we do to make sure that these patients are in their facility and are thriving in their facility, in their new environment, that they're getting the adequate care that they were receiving before the transfer. Um, and I'd like to, in speaking with Director Cooper, I just want to reiterate, Director Cooper, that um, this perhaps is not something that can be done legislatively. Could you share with me? Let, let me back, let me finish my thoughts, or do you want to go ahead? So my thought here is that we have these employees who um, are currently working for Signature. We've um, advised, uh, uh, something that's been negotiated, they're going to move on and receive a severance package. However, I think, we are in this fiscal year, so this is a little bit budgetary, but we have um, funding available to, or that was set aside to take care of these patients. It was set aside to take care of these patients in the long-term care in Bordeaux facility. Now that they're leaving that facility, I'd like to see, can we make sure, as a committee, can we make sure that these patients are continuing to receive adequate care through that transition because their lives can be put in danger by making this transition. So what I'd like to know, um, Director Cooper, is there a mechanism that we could use as a council body to ensure that that happens, or is that something, um, what's the best approach for us to take for that? So uh, assuming that, you know, once, once the patients are transferred and Signature no longer has um, responsibility for their health care, then it would, it would be up to the patients or the family members that have the decision-making authority for them whether to allow any additional consultation or involvement of Signature or Metro. But assuming that they chose to, to have that consultation or follow up, I think the if Signature was willing to do it, there could potentially be a addendum or an amendment to the existing contract that would allow that oversight. Um, I, I don't, I don't know whether that would require council approval or not. I, I haven't thought through it that far. Um, if the health department did that, potentially whatever funds are left over could be appropriated by the council to the health department to pr provide those services. Thank you. I guess where I'm going with that is, so there's a financial piece of that, but more importantly, what I'm focused on in this committee is about the care of these patients. and so. Rather than stopping the wind down, which at this point, unfortunately, in this terrible series of events that has been going on now for, for many months, uh, and that this, this committee and this council body found out about, I think, much later than any of us um, would have desired to find out, for whatever reason at this point, I want to make sure that we are doing all that we can as a city to use taxpayer dollars as they originally were designed to do at the beginning of this budget year, which was to take care of these patients. And so I believe we have a responsibility to continue to care for these patients for all of the, the 100 plus who have already been transferred out in addition to the remaining patients who have not yet been transferred. So I, it sounds like that might be something administratively that we can work through the um, the mayor's office to see what could be done with the existing contract or could the health department take this up. So chair, I would just say if, if I would like to explore that and be glad to take that on, 
um, and, and find out how, I might, how we might be able to do that and get the administration to do that. Um, and, and then my, if, if I may have one more question, just um, we spoke a little bit about the bed count. I think the bed count is something that's valuable here. Are we going to, and can you, someone explain the bed count and what that means? And are we going to lose that? And how does it impact any future value that the city has for providing care to patients in the future? So um, the, the bed licenses that a medical facility has is how the state essentially regulates new and oncoming medical facilities. They'll go through fairly complicated procedures called a CON or certificate of need. And if Council Lady Benedict wanted to open up uh, the Benedict Hospital in Madison, you couldn't just open up the Benedict Hospital in Madison. You have to go to the state and have them acknowledge the need for medical services in that particular area and they do or do not issue you a certificate of need. That has become controversial in recent decades, and there are some that argue that it's anti-competitive, that the established facilities use pressure against the state to stop them from granting certificates of need, and it's become somewhat of a morass. But once you get your bed licenses, that is a commodity that you don't want to lose, and we have no interest in forsaking the 419 bed licenses. We can put them and we'll put them on inactive status so that we're not paying an, an annual fee that you have to pay on them while they're otherwise active. But they are then available to whomever the council eventually declares, be it National General Hospital, be it a third party operator, be it nobody else, that they can then issue those licenses to that practitioner to use and operate. And speaking with Dr. Webb, uh, among others who might be interested, he is satisfied that we've taken the appropriate precautions to keep those licenses for now inactive, but eventually accessible to him uh, while he reviews the signature records. Thank you. That answers my questions, Chair. I just would say to the committee, I can't support this resolution as it is, and it's very frustrating to me that I can't, especially because the way that I found out about this transfer and how it was coming, which I believe is how all of us found out about it, um, Nevertheless, I think at this point, again, I said the, how the horse has left, left the barn. I think at this point, it's in the best interest of these patients to receive continued care by the city. Um, now that they have been transferred, it doesn't make sense for them to stay in that facility. Therefore, I would not support this resolution. Thank you, Chair. Council Member Hurt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And for those same very reasons is why I can not um, not sign on this for those same very reasons because I am not going to say at any time that I agree with the closing of Bordo Hospital. I understand that the horses left the barn, but my concern is, as I told um, Mr. Jameson and I told the mayor, it's not what you do, but how you do it. If this started in 2014, the wind down should have started then as well. We should have properly planned for this, properly planned, informed the employees, the families, and let them be a part of everything that we are doing now. Without that, it's almost like giving people false hope that the place is going to be able to maintain and stay open. It seemed to be, as I told Ms. Falls, a waste of time to put out an RFP or RFQ because people were not going to give, uh, uh, try to provide any type of care where they're going to lose money. So I think that we put we place our treasures to those things that we value the most. And I don't think that we valued what we had. And to Councilman Governor's point, I think he was meaning that the Bordo population has been neglected, not necessarily the Bordo long-term care facility. So um, to that point, I ask if there is any way that any funds that have been allocated for Bordeaux be used to help other needed services, um, 
in the North Nashville community. You cannot remove something and not replace something. We have to have balance. Don't have in without out, up without down. If you're gonna remove, you have to replace. So if we're gonna have funds that are designated from CARES, or if there are funds from some other pool of money that has been designated, I ask that those funds stay in that community and serve that community well. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Hurt. And I, I agree with um, Council Member Glover. Uh, one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm most worried about is that uh, we, we can have hundreds of or, or patients and residents in this facility, but if we leave one behind, what's the plan? Um, and, and, and that's, that's the worry that, that I've shared with this committee, with this body, uh, since I've, I've thought about this. And, and so that we, we can have confidence in signature, um, to try to place these individuals. But if we don't get them placed, what is the plan moving forward? Um, how long will signature stay there? How long will we, we be able to subsidize it? So that's, uh, one of the questions I have for you, Mr. Jamison, if you could, could help. Do we have a plan? I'll say what I know, and I'm going to call upon uh, Mr. Cross and Ms. Falls, who were uh, in sort of the face-to-face -face negotiations portions, if you will. Um, Signature can't leave with a patient remaining. That's the bottom line. They just can't. The, the patient population that is in their care and control remains in their care and control. That is why they are incentivized to make sure they are transferred to another licensed medical facility there are other signature facilities in the county, and maybe they have a motivation to get them into another signature facility. But by and large, they are going to facilities that are higher rated. Uh, you all read that there was an outbreak of, I believe, 49 COVID cases at this particular facility. By and large, they are going to facilities that had less, even zero COVID cases. We have had no doubt in our mind that the transfer is in the best interest of the patients irrespective of what the physicians have told us and that I've relayed to you, but in our own assessment, this is in their best interests. But I, I don't know if Tom or Mary have anything. It, it, the, the contract does specify that it's in signatures, that, that they can't just walk out on the patients. Um, and if that's, if there's anything. That, that's an accurate statement. They, they, they can't abandon the patients. They have to keep a presence there until they've got everybody One other thing I'd like to uh, just make a part of the record is that once the wind down has taken place and everything has closed, what's going to happen to the campus? Because it's sitting on prime property. And anything that's done on that campus, for that campus, I want to make sure that it is inclusive of the people of that community and whatever is done. I know that it would be said that there are no plans. And I say shame on you because there should be. If we are shutting this down and we have no plans on what's gonna to happen to that land and to that property at this point in time, shame on us because we should know. We should have some type of idea of what's going to take place in that land, in that area. So, whatever does become a part of a plan, I want to make sure that there is inclusion, transparency uh, for those people and the community that, in which that land sits. Council Member. Yes. So, uh, redevelopment plan of 2015. We have in our, in our written materials to the council members, we pose the question as whether or not the administration had any secret designs or intentions for redevelopment of the property? No, we have expressed repeatedly and have stated so in the memorandum and again today, we're committed to fulfilling the desires of the Bordeaux community for the property as set forth in the Bordeaux redevelopment plan of 2015 and committed to con continued engagement with the community. I would also add that Dr. Webb who's begun circulating to council members, his redevelopment plans for Nashville General Hospital He's looking at three potential sites. One of them includes Bordeaux, but he specifically does not want the building. And I don't blame him. 
And so to pour an ounce of money into a building that if he proceeds with that site within bulldoze makes no sense to me at all. And to think that we would waste millions of dollars that could go towards a worthwhile project towards that venture seems at best wrongheaded. And I would urge this council to not go down that road. Thank you. Councilmember Glover. If I may, this is really more of a statement, and I'll, I'll kind of make it to the chair and to Mr. Cooper. So the other piece that bothers me about this, you do have, I don't know what the land's worth. I mean, I don't know, don't have a clue. But I do know we have 419 licenses. That's the asset. That's, that's what you're sitting on there. And what I don't want to see happen is because I was here, as was Council Lady Allen, we were here. We watched. We listened. I think we both voted for, the, for this transition with the assurances this was going to work. The part that bothers me, and I'm just going to say it, and it'll be on tape so anybody can come back and listen to it, is that if Metro General gets it, you know, are we going to go further in the hole? Because we can't afford to go there. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, the, the public-private uh, if you're going to try to make something like this work, is the way to go. Where I get concerned is that 419 beds, all of a sudden the administration decides, oh, we've got this great idea, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. I really would like for the council to be involved because those 419 is not owned by the administration, it's owned by the city. And as stewards of the city's money, uh, I think it's imperative that we uh, stay very involved on understanding exactly what's happening with what I consider to be what might be the largest asset that we'll walk away from here. Uh, and so I don't know how we do that, Mr. <clears throat> Cooper. Uh, I don't know if any other council members are interested in that, but guys, I gotta tell you, well, that's that's the one right. we gotta keep our eye on. That's I think the, you're absolutely yeah. right. So, council, in some way, shape or form, I would, uh, and I know Dr. Webb, it's, it, it will take, we need to give him the due time to evaluate the large volume of records that he has. I know Mark is here from National General Hospital. He's been taking assiduous notes. I bet we'll get a, an update from him shortly. But I imagine it'll come back to council with Dr. Webb's assessment of here's what I can do and here's what it'll cost. What I don't want to see happen though, Mr. Jameson, and let me be frank, is it come to us and we found a grant. We got to pass it this week. If we don't, we're going to miss this money. Now that, that maybe is exaggerated to a degree, but it really is not because too frequently that occurs to this body. And I don't want to see that uh, because th there is a value here. Unfortunately, what was tried did not work. Uh, I'm glad to see, I do believe we have an umbrella with or the golden parachute with the state. I mean, based on what I know, I don't do a lot of long-term care stuff, but what I do know of it, the state, I mean, if you, you want to get, you want to get in trouble, the state can get you in trouble real fast. Um, so I'm glad about that piece. I'm glad to know that in the contract, they cannot walk away until the last person is served. Uh, I too, you know, with regards to the money, I'd have a different aspect of the way I would look at that. But those 419 licenses, that in my mind is what you, what you walk out with as a true asset for the city. Thank you, Chair, for indulging me. There's been a assessment that has been requested and has began to, uh, they've started the assessment uh, from National General. Um, Mark, will you, do you have any updates in where you all are in, in regards to uh, pre performing the assessment? So we're right in the middle of uh, trying to analyze all the data. There are some confidential records we are not allowed access to because they're proprietary and, and so forth. So. Our analysis, I don't think it's going to be complete, but I know we're going through it. We're trying to keep uh, Council Lady Toombs apprised as well. So everything Mike has said, uh, particularly about the patient abandonment, Tom, um, this, well, Signature can get in a lot of trouble. Uh, mm -hmm. They can lose their Medicare billing rights and so forth. So um, we're just happy to do whatever the council and the mayor's administration wants us to do. Happy to continue and we'll provide you with uh, the conclusions Dr. Webb comes to the next few weeks. Thank you. Councilmember Benedict. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, thank you. Thank you all at National General with what you all are doing in, in response to this as well. We, we really appreciate it. Uh, do we have any, any additional discussion? 
All right. So the motion has been approved and properly seconded. All in favor for RS 202665, please say aye. 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 All opposed? No. All right. All right. Three in favor, three against. So, yeah, no recommendation. All right. Thank you so much for the conversation uh, on this. A resolution accepting, uh, we have a late flower resolution from Council Member Toombs, a resolution accepting a Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act grant from the Northern Middle Tennessee Local Workforce Development Board as the WIOA grant recipient from the Tennessee Department of Labor and the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County acting by and through the Metropolitan Action Commission for the provision of establishing programs and services in an integrated workforce system as the career services provider through the American Job Center as authorized under public law 113-1-128 of the WIOA. Uh, there is a second, probably moved and probably second, there's a letter to approve from Council Member Toombs. Any discussion? Any, anyone from Metro Action Commission like to say anything? Evening, I'm Lisa McCray, the Director of Communications, and I'm just really excited about this opportunity. You may remember that we had this, the city had this grant years ago, um, but we lost it. Uh, it, had, it was administered through the NCAC, and so when we found out about the opportunity, we applied, and so we were awarded the Davidson <laughs> County portion of it, and so it does provide some expanded opportunities for in-school and out-of-school youth. So we're very excited um, to be administering this in the city of Nashville. Thank you so much, Mr. President. Councilman Hart. I, I just want to say I'm excited about it, too. I know that uh, when I was on the uh, Tennessee Workforce Development Board that this was probably the most robust uh, program that they had, and it was really, really great. So happy to see that Metro Action is able to take it and, and get the funding and really put it to work. So. This is kind of uh, a, a beautiful marriage, so I'm really happy. Thank you. Thank you so much. We've any additional discussion? It's been probably second, uh, moved and probably second. Um, all in favor? Aye. Any against? And BL 202505 by Councilmember Hall directs the Metro purchasing agent to enter into an emergency contract for the continued operation of Bordeaux Long Term Care Facility for the remainder of the fiscal year 2021 and affirming the Council's intention that the care and appropriation in the fiscal year 2021 operating budget for the Bordeaux Long Term Care Facility management be used to fund emergency contract. Uh, Councilmember Hall is not here, so this will be deferred by rule. All right. Who would be entering into an emergency contract with? Don't we? Yeah. We, we, that hasn't been determined. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. The, the, yeah no Am I saying that correctly? There is no identified right. operator. Right. That's right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.